Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is IBM and today I'm solving 9702 paper 4 to October November 2022. This is A level structured questions and without wasting time I would like to take you to the question paper. So this is the question paper that I'm going to solve. The paper is supposed to be two hours. I hope I'll try my level best to keep time. So I'll just go straight to the questions. Question number one, define gravitational field. Gravitational field. So sometimes we define gravitational field as a region of space, but many times you will find it being defined as force per unit mass. But precisely, a field is a region of space, so sometimes you will define gravitational field as a region of space where a unit mass where a unit mass experiences a force that is a region of space where a unit mass experiences a force but many times you'll find it defined as mass per unit mass and you also find a gravitational field strength G defined again as mass per unit, a uh, force per unit mass. Because normally when we talk about a gravitational field, we are actually referring to the gravitational field strength, which is force per unit mass. A spherical planet can be considered as a point mass at its center. On the figure, draw um, gravitational field lines outside the planet to represent the gravitational field due to the planet. Of course, remember the field lines are radial, and because the force is always attractive, so the field lines should be pointing towards the center of the planet. So I'll draw at least, uh, maybe I'll draw like four lines. So the field lines are supposed to be radial and they should point towards the center of the earth. So those are going to be the gravitational field lines. A satellite is in a circular orbit around a planet. Explain with reference to your answer in B Roman 1 why the path of the satellite is circular. B Roman 1, in B Roman 1 we have the field lines being radial and terminating towards the center which means the force is attractive and of course the field is or the field is going to be perpendicular to the direction of, uh, of the velocity of the satellite therefore the field, the gravitational force just provides centripetal acceleration. So I'll say, because I said with the reference to B Roman 1 where we have field lines, so I'll say the field lines Field lines uh, show that show that uh, the force on the satellite is towards the center. The center of The planet. So the gravitation, uh, the field lines show that the force on the satellite is towards the center of the planet. So the gravitational force is perpendicular to the velocity. The gravitational force is perpendicular to the velocity and so
and so it causes a centripetal acceleration. So the gravitational force is perpendicular to the velocity, and so it causes centripetal acceleration. That's why it moves in a circular path. Then question C, an object rests on the surface of the Earth at the equator. That is just above the, uh, at the equator. Okay, the radius of the Earth is 6.4 times 10 to the power of uh, 6 meters. We time the centripetal acceleration of, of the object. So at the equator, it is it rests, the object rests on the surface of the Earth at the equator. And it means the object is moving around the center of the Earth um, just by the rotation of the Earth, with the rotation of... Um, okay, the time the centripetal acceleration of the object, so if it is moving, it is spinning with the Earth uh, about its axis, so we know that the centripetal force M Centripetal force m is equal to mv squared over r. If you compare this with the mass times a, so it means the centripetal acceleration ac is v squared divided by r. Remember, remember that v is equal to omega times r, which means the centripetal acceleration, and by the way, omega is 2 pi divided by t, so this is 2 pi t over, over t times r. So the centripetal acceleration is going to be 4 pi squared over t squared times, uh, this is r squared. Then in the denominator, we have times r. I just substituted for v squared. So 1 r cancels, which becomes 4 pi squared divided by um, t squared times 1 r. So I'll just substitute the values. So the centripetal acceleration is going to be 4 pi squared times r, which is times 6.4 times 10 to the power of 6, divided by the period is, um, the period is going to be the period of rotation of the Earth about its axis, which is 24 hours. So the period is 24 hours. So this is going to be 2, 4 times 3,600. Because the object on the surface must be spinning about the center of the Earth, uh, about this, uh, the axis of the Earth with the Earth itself. So the period is going to be the period of rotation of the Earth, which is one, which is one day, which is 24 hours. So I'll have 4 pi squared times 6.4 exponent 6. I will divide this by uh, 24 times 3,600. So this gives me a uh, 20, did I square pi? Oh, t is squared, the other one, sorry about that. I'll have to repeat this, 4 pi squared times 4 pi squared times 6.4 exponent 6 divided by um, 24 times 3600 but this should be squared so this is giving me 0 0.0338 so this is going to be 0 0.0338 Describe how the two forces acting on the object give rise to the centripetal acceleration. You may draw a diagram. So let's assume, I'm going to assume that this is the Earth. And let's say the object is just on the surface of the Earth. So the gravitational pull on the object towards its center is going to be equal to the weight of the object. This is the force due to gravity, which is the gravitational pull. This is the force due to gravity on the object. Then there is a contact force on the object. There is a contact force on the object from the Earth in the opposite direction. This is going to be the contact. The contact force. If the object remains stable on the Earth, if the object is remaining stable on the Earth, 
it's only because the gravitational force is greater than the contact force. So it means there is a resultant force here. The resultant is going to be the weight minus the contact force. Which resultant is going to be uh, providing the centripetal force? So the resultant is going to be Fc. So to put this in writing, I'll say the gravitational force and the normal force, the normal contact force on the object are in opposite directions. So the gravitational force, that is the pull of gravity on the object, which is its weight, and the normal contact force, that is at the point of contact of the object on the earth, which is going to be vertical upwards, these are going to be in opposite directions, and they are resultant, and they are resultant, they are resultant is what causes the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so the resultant of the contact force and the gravitational pull towards the center of the Earth is what provides, is what causes the centripetal acceleration because it's what provides the centripetal force. Then this is heat, define specific heat capacity. We already said specific, that is one kilogram. And here there's a temperature change. So uh, the thermal energy per unit, ma uh, per unit mass required to change the temperature. The temperature of the substance by uh, either you can say by one Kelvin or you can say by one degree Celsius. That is called the specific capacity. When I say per unit mass, remember I said it is one kilogram. So that thermal energy per unit mass required to change the temperature of a substance is for, uh, by one Kelvin or by one degree Celsius is called a specific capacity. A fixed mass of water in a beaker at atmospheric pressure is at atmospheric pressure. The initial temperature of the water is zero degrees Celsius. The water is supplied with thermal energy E. This is supplied, so it is going to be positive. So that the temperature increases to, so the temperature is from zero to eight degrees Celsius. There is no net change in the volume, so that means the change in volume is equal to zero. Use the first law of thermodynamics to complete the table for this process. So there is no net change in the temperature, so for this part here we know that the work done is equal to pressure times change in the volume. Since there is no net change in the volume, it means um, delta V is equal to zero, so it means the work done here is going to be zero. So here I will put a zero. Then this other part here, we know that Q, I mean uh, change in internal energy or increase in internal energy is equal to Q plus W because uh, Q is plus E and work done is zero, it means this is going to be plus, plus E. The water is now heated so that its temperature increases by a further 80 degrees. So now the change in temperature is from 80 degrees Celsius to 16 degrees Celsius. The process is the process causes the volume of the water to increase so that work W is done. 
So the work done here is going to be W. And the volume has increased. So this volume, this work done is negative. Because the volume increases, the work done uh, the work done uh, on the system itself is negative because it's actually the system which is doing work because the volume is increasing. So increasing in volume means negative work done on the system. Assume that the change in internal energy is the same as in B. The change in internal energy is the same as in B. So in B, the change in internal energy was plus, plus E. And we have already seen that uh, the volume increases. An increase in the volume means a negative work done. So this is going to be negative W. So we want to find the thermal energy. So I'll use increase in internal energy is equal to Q plus W or work done, which is going to be Q. I want to make Q the subject. So Q is going to be change in internal energy minus W which is change internal energy is plus E minus W, which is negative W. So it is going to be E plus W. So this is going to be E plus W. Okay. Then use the information in B to suggest with a reason how the average specific heat capacity of water between 80 degrees and 16 degrees compares with that between 0 degrees and 80 degrees. So I'll just use the expression um, Q. I'll use Q equals to mc delta theta. So C is going to be Q over m times change in the temperature. So First of all, the change in temperature is the same from 8 to 16, and the other one is 0 to 8. So the change in temperature is 8. And if we assume that um, the first law of thermodynamics says that change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W. So it means... Um, for the first one, remember there was no work done. So that means the change in internal energy, which is directly proportional, or Q was directly proportional to the change, Q was just equal to the change in internal energy. And then for the second one, Q is equal to the change in internal energy plus work done. So the question is use the uh, Use the information to suggest with a reason how the average specific heat capacity of water between 8 and 16 compares with its average value between 0 and, and 8 degrees Celsius. So for this one, for 8 to 16 degrees Celsius, specific capacity is going to be the Change in internal energy is going to be Q is going to be E plus W divided by M times delta theta. Then for the other one, from 0 to 8 degrees Celsius, the specific capacity will be equal to just E is equal to Q. I mean, Q was just equal to plus E divided by M times delta theta. So notice that this quantity here is smaller than this one here. So it means more thermal energy is supplied to the water between 80 degrees to 16 degrees. So the specific capacity is higher. So I'll simply say more thermal energy. Is supplied. To the water between 80 degrees Celsius to uh, 16 degrees Celsius because it's E plus W. So the specific heat capacity is greater. So you have just seen specific capacity directly proportional to the amount of energy which is supplied. 
and we are seeing for the energy supplied between 8 and 16 is E plus W, yet the energy supplied between 0 to, 0 to 8 degrees was just E. So more heat is supplied between 8 to 16, and therefore the specific capacity is going to be greater. Question 3 is ideal gases, I think. So the meaning of each of the symbols in the equation. Of course, we know that P is pressure of the gas. V is the volume of the gas. N is the number of molecules. It's not number of moles, number of molecules. Then key, uh, K is Boltzmann's constant. Some of these quantities, you can check them in the formula given Boltzmann's or in the list of constants, Boltzmann's constant. Then uh, T is absolute temperature or thermodynamic temperature. It's not just temperature, but thermodynamic temperature. Use the equation in A to show that the average translational kinetic energy equal of a molecule of an ideal gas is given by that expression. Okay, so we have been given that PV is equal to NKT. But we also know that PV is equal to, this is always given the list of formula, it is 1 over 3 m n average of c squared this is given the list of formula so i will just equate the two equations so i'll say um a third m n mean square speed is equal to n k times t so i'll first cancel out n i'm going to multiply both sides by a half so i have one over three times a half m mean square speed is equal to kt times a half so i have multiplied i've taken i'm taking the three the other side so i have one over three m i mean one over two m mean square speed is equal to three over two times kt so we know that a half m average c squared is equal to is the same as kinetic energy so it implies you know that a half, ek is equal to a half m c squared so this implies that ek is going to be equal to 3 over 2 times kt the mass of ox of an oxygen molecule is 5.31 times 10 to the power of minus 26 kilograms Assume that oxygen behaves as an ideal gas, so that means that equation can be used. Use the equation in B, which equation is that in B, okay? To determine the root mean square speed, U, of the oxygen molecule. So we have already just seen that a half M mean square speed, this is kinetic energy, this is going to be equal to 3 over 2 times KT. So they are saying use the equation to determine the root mean square speed. So I find the square root of both sides. So if I find the square root of both sides, where there is a c squared, I will just put there u squared, because it will be the mean square speed. But then I will have to find the square root. So I'll just simply say a half times the mass, which is 5.31 times 10 to the power of minus 26, where there is a mean square speed, I'll just put there u squared should be equal to 3 over 2. Boltzmann's constant, I think, is 1.38 times 10 to the power of minus 23. It is given the list of constants. Then temperature. Temperature is 23 degrees Celsius, which is, I think that is 223 plus 273, which is 296. So I'll multiply this by 296 to change it to Kelvin. So I'm just going to find u as the square root of 2 as cancelled. So I have 3 times 1.3, 1.3 1 
8 times 10 to the power of minus 23 times 296 divided by 5.31 times 10 to the power of minus 26. 3 times 1.38 exponent minus 23 times 296 divided by a 5.31 exponent minus 26 so this is two point so i have to find the square root of this answer square root of the answer this is 480 to be precise it is 480 meters per second a fixed mass of oxygen gas at Initial pressure P is sealed in a, cylind a cylindrical container by a movable piston at one end, as shown in the figure. The temperature of the gas is 23 degrees Celsius, which means the initial speed is, is going to be the same as the one that we considered previously. The piston is slowly moved into the cylinder so that the oxygen gas is compressed. At all times, the gas and the container remain in a thermal equilibrium with the surroundings. So now it enters or leaves the surrounding. On the figure, sketch the variation with pressure P of the root mean square speed of root to mean square speed of the oxygen gas. Okay. So um since we are the temperature of the gas is initially 23 degrees Celsius, we say that at 23 degrees Celsius initial speed was equal to u. So my graph is going to start with u. Then we know that, uh, of course, we know that uh, PV is equal to 1 over 3 mn times the mean square speed, or we can say PV is equal to 1 over 3, MN times the square, I mean times U squared. Okay, so it means that U squared or U is equal to a constant times the square root of PV. Okay. So um, note that so I want us to note that as a p is inversely proportional to v in the first place, p is inversely proportional to v, but the gas is being compressed, so it means v is decreasing. As v decreases, p increases which means uh, PV is always going to be equal to a constant. PV is always going to be equal to a constant. What does that mean? U is always going to be a constant times a constant, so U is going to be equal to a constant, as simple as that. Because P is inversely proportional to V. As V is decreased because of the compression, P is going to be increased, and the product PV will still remain a constant. That means u is going to be constant. So precisely, this is going to be a horizontal line. As the volume is decreased because of compression, the pressure is going to increase. And therefore, p times v will always be a constant. And therefore, it means this is going to be, u is going to be equal to a constant, which is going to be a, a horizontal line. So that is going to be the graph here. The figure shows the variation with the time t of the height h above the ground of an object of mass 36 kilograms. So this is simple harmonic motion. For the oscillations of the object, determine x naught. So the, the graph is symmetrical about this point here. So maximum displacement is going to be 18. x naught is going to be 18 minus 2. Then I divide this by 2. So this is going to be 16 over 2, which is going to be 8 centimeters. So the answer here is going to be 8.0 centimeters. The amplitude is this vertical displacement from equilibrium position, which is 8. 
show that the angular frequency omega is 1.6. So remember, we know that omega is equal to 2 pi divided by period, which is 2 pi. We look at the graph for the period here. So I think the period is 4. From 2 to 6, that's one cycle. 6 minus 2, which is 4. So this is going to be divided by 4.0. So 2 pi divided by 4. So this is 1.57. So this is 1.57 or approximately 1.6 radians per second. Then determine the total energy. Of course, we know that total energy is the same as maximum energy, which is a half m omega squared times x naught squared. And of course, we know that x naught is 8 centimeters, which is 8 times 10 to the power of x naught is 8 times 10 to the power of minus 2 to change it to meters. So the energy here is going to be a half. I think the mass was 66. For omega, I don't want to use 1.6. Let me just put here 2 pi divide by um, 4. Well, this should be squared. Then times x naught, which is 8 point 0 times 10 to the power of minus 2, and this should also be squared. So I'll say, um, I'll first square this. I'll first square that times 8.0, 8.0 exponent minus 2, where this is squared, then times 36, and I'll divide this by 2. So I'm getting 0 0.28. So it is 0 0.28. Alternatively, if I use, I'll check this using a 1.6. I may get a different, slightly different value for 1.6. So for 1.6, I'll say 0 0.5. Let me say, oh, I can say a half times 36 times 1.6 squared, times 8 times 10 to the power of negative 2, and this is also squared. So 0 0.5 times 36 times 1.6 squared, then times 8, 8 exponent um, minus 2, and this is squared. So for this one, you may get 0 0.29 joules, but both answers will be accepted. On the figure sketch variation with H of the kinetic energy EK of the object. So we are going to sketch the variation with the kinetic. Remember, the graph was symmetrical at, at 10. So this is where X equals to 0. Then the maximum displacement goes up to 2. This is supposed to be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is going to be here. Then 15 to 18. So this is 16, 17, 18. So this is 18. So here, we, this is where displacement is maximum. This is where displacement is maximum. And this is where displacement is zero at the equilibrium point here. So the graph is going to be symmetric about this vertical, this line at 10. So remember, at maximum displacement, when x equals to zero, kinetic energy is equal to maximum. So it is going to be zero point let me just take a uh, 2 watt. Let me see the scale. The scale on the vertical is 0 0.01. Let me just take to 0 0.29. So I'll take the previous, I'll take this one here, 0 0.29 joules. So the scale on the vertical is 0 0.01. So 0 0.29, 2, 1, Two nine is along this this line here. So when x is equal to zero, kinetic energy is supposed to be zero point 
0.29 joules. It is maximum because kinetic energy is maximum when displacement is zero. And when x equals to when x remember when x equals to zero, h is 10. When x equals to x naught, which is eight centimeters, h is going to be either two centimeters or h is going to be 18 centimeters. What is the kinetic energy here? When displacement is maximum, kinetic energy goes to zero. So it means at x equals to zero, kinetic energy is maximum. This is the point. And at x equals to x naught, which is eight centimeters, h is going to either be two centimeters, that is at two centimeters, or h is going to be 18 centimeters. So at two centimeters, kinetic energy is zero, and at 18 centimeters, kinetic energy is zero. So the graph is going to be a dome shape. It's not very beautiful. Okay, so the graph is going to be a dome shape. You can do a very beautiful dome shape curve around uh, with a maximum at 10 centimeters where, where displacement is zero. So uh, H is either two centimeters at maximum displacement on one direction and 18 centimeters at maximum displacement in one direction that is above 10. So the graph looks like that. Then electric fields uh, define electric potential. Of course, we know electric potential. For electric fields, we always consider positive charge. So this is going to be the work done per unit charge. In moving, A unit in moving a positive charge because I've already said per unit charge I will not repeat myself the work done per unit charge in moving a positive charge from from infinity to the point That is what we call electric potential. We must consider positive charge for electric fields. It's not the same case with the masses of uh, magnetic fields. An isolated conducting sphere is charged. The figure shows the variation of the potential V due to the sphere with the displacement X from its center. Okay, of course, we know that potential uh, inside is constant. And the moment it stops being constant, it means we have moved outside. We are going away from the surface. So where the potential stops being constant is where the surface of the sphere stops. So if I was to sketch a sphere, it, is, it could be something like that. Use the figure to determine the radius of the sphere. So the radius of the sphere stops here. I think this is 0 0.6. I mean 0 0.06. So um, the radius of the sphere is going to be 0 0.06 meters. Then the charge on the sphere. Remember, potential on the given surface is going to be the charge on the sphere over 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance from the center. So the charge is going to be 4 pi epsilon naught times x then times the potential V. Of course, the potential is negative, so the charge is going to be negative. So the charge is going to be equal to 4 pi times 8.85 times 10 to the power of minus 12. Then the radius is 0 0.06, that is x. 0 0.06, then times negative 
what is the potential? So the potential on the surface is this value here, which is, I think this is 800 and the scale on the vertical is 0 to 250 divided by 10. The scale is 25. So 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 times 25, that is 100. So this value is 850. So this would be times negative 850. So the charge is going to be automatically negative. So it is 4 pi times 8.85 exponent minus 12 times 0 0.06 then times 850. So we are getting negative 5.67 times 10 to the power of negative 9 columns. Two spheres are identical to the sphere in B. Each sphere has the same charge as the sphere in B. Same charge, which is, remember, it is negative 5.67 times 10 to the power of negative 9 columns, so they are like charges. The spheres are held in a vacuum so that their centers are separated by a distance of 0 0.4. So the separation of the spheres is 0 0.46 meters. Assume that the charge on each sphere is a point charge at the center of the sphere. Calculate the electric potential energy of the spheres. So we know that electric potential energy is equal to potential times charge or charge times potential. So which is the same as Q times another charge, a smaller charge over 4 pi epsilon naught times X. That is electric potential. So since they are identical, I'll just square Q and capital Q and small Q are the same. So I'll just say 5.67 times 10 to the power of minus 9. And I'll just square this, divide by 4 pi times epsilon, which is 8.85 times 10 to the power of minus 12. Their separation x is 0 0.0.46. 0 you could also use uh, k as 8.99 times 10 to the power of 9 instead of using 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Okay. So I'll just check my calculator. 5.67 exponent minus 9. But well, this is squared. I'll divide this by 4 pi. Divide this by, I would say, 0 0.46 times 8.85 exponent minus 12. So this is 6.28 times 10 to the power of minus 7. Joules. The two spheres are now released simultaneously so that they are, they are free to move. So they are released at the same time so that they are free to move. Remember they are carrying light charges so they repel each other. And they are now moving in the same direction as the force on each. So that means their speed must be increasing. But remember, as they move further, the force, which is equal to mass times acceleration, is equal to the product of the uh, a constant times the product of the charges divided by the square of the separation. So as they move further, as x increases, the force decreases. That means the accession decreases, so the accession will later on decrease. So describe and explain the subsequent motion of the spheres. First of all, they are moving in the direction of the forces, so they increase. They, they, are, they are accelerating, their speed increases, but with the time, the separation, uh, as the separation increases, the force between them decreases, which means the acceleration with the time decreases. So how should I write this? Okay. Let me just simply say uh, the spheres are both negative.
So spheres both have negative charge. Spheres both have negative charge. So the force between them is repulsive. So force is repulsive. Because the force is repulsive, the spheres move apart. Spheres both have negative charge, force is repulsive. Because they both have negative charge, the force between them is repulsive, which means the spheres move apart. That's number one. So if they move apart, it means the force is in the same direction as their motion, so the speed, their speed increases. The force is in direction of motion, so the force is in the direction of motion, so speed Their speed increases. So force is in the direction of motion, so the speed increases. But remember, I said um, as the force, as the force, as we, the, as the, as the spheres move further apart, the distance r or the distance x increases, and the force is inversely proportional to the square of that distance. That means that as they move further apart, the force decreases. Because as the distance increases, the force decreases. So the force decreases and the acceleration also decreases. So in a nutshell, it means uh, it means that uh, the acceleration is also going to to decrease with the time. So I'll also say force is in the direction of motion, so the speed increases. But f is inversely proportional to x squared. So the force decreases with the distance, hence acceleration decreases. The force decreases. The force decreases with the distance. And so the acceleration decreases. So the acceleration decreases. You would also explain this in terms of electric potential energy being converted into kinetic energy. Remember, the force, uh, there is an ele electric potential energy between them which becomes kinetic energy when they are released. But then, of course, the electric potential energy is going to decrease as they move further apart, which also means um, even though the kinetic energy increases, it has, uh, with the time, the speed, uh, although the kinetic energy increases, the force is later on going to decrease. Therefore, it still implies that uh, this, the acceleration or the rate at which the speed increases, decreases when the spheres move further apart. You can also explain this in terms of momentum. For instance, the spheres both have negative charge, the force is repulsive, and the spheres move apart, which means um, the momentum is going to the momentum is conserved because it was initially zero before release, and when they move in opposite directions, and they remember they have the same masses, so it means the velocities are always going to be equal and also opposite, or the spheres are going to move further apart with the same velocities with equal and opposite velocity so that the total momentum always remains zero. But this is this explanation I've given here is more direct because the spheres have the like, uh, have like charges, they repel each other. And if they repel each other, it means they are moving in the same direction as the resultant force on them. And the force is in the direction of motion, so the speed is going to increase. But remember, F is inversely proportional to the distance, so the force decreases with the distance, and because the force decreases, the acceleration is directly proportion, proportion to the force. So 
it means the accession is going to decrease. Then question six is capacitance. Uh, a capacitor of capacitance C and a resistor of resistance R are connected as shown in the figure below. Initially, the capacitor is charged and the switch is open. So initially, the capacitor is charged and the switch is open. The switch is closed at T equals to zero. That means the capacitor now dis starts discharging in the fixed resistor. Figure 6.2 and figure 6.3 show respectively the variations with the T of the charge Q on the capacitor and the PDV across the resistor. Explain the shape of the line in figure 6.3 representing the variation of V with the T. Okay, so of course we know that V is equal to I times R, which means that V is going to be directly proportional to the current. So it, it doesn't, it is not surprising that the graphs have the same shape. That's number one. Then number two, we also know that capacitance, or we also know that charge is equal to C times V, which means charge is also directly proportional to P. So a graph of Q against time is most likely going to be similar to a graph of V against time. So what will I write here? So I'll simply say the current in the resistor, the current in the resistor is proportional to the PD across it. That is from V equals to IR. The current in the resistor is proportional to the PD across it. That one I've used V is equal to I times R. The current in the resistor is proportional to the PD across the PD across it. But the current which is flowing through the resistor is going to cause the capacitor to lose uh, to lose charge. But the current flowing but the current flowing uh, through the current flowing through uh, the resistor causes the capacitor to lose charge It causes the capacitor to lose charge. And also remember that the PD across the resistor is the same as the PD across the capacitor. But the current flowing through the resistor causes the capacitor to lose charge. Why didn't I add here a statement which says that the PD across PD across the resistor is the same as the PD across the capacitor. The reason is because they are in parallel. So when I close the switch here, I make the, the resistor to be uh, across the capacitor plate. So it means the PD across the capacitor is equal to the PD across uh, the resistor. But the current flowing through the resistor causes the capacitor to lose charge. And also from the charge Q is equal to C times V, it means the charge on the capacitor is proportional. to um, the PD, the charge on the capacitor is proportional to the PD, the PD across the capacitor. So remember the PD across the resistor is the same as the PD across the capacitor. And we are saying from Q equals to 
CV, the charge on the capacitor is proportional to the PD across across it. So the PD decreases exponentially, just like the charge. So if the charge if the charge is equal to CV, it means the charge is directly proportional to V. So the charge is directly proportional to the PD. But remember, the, uh, the charge, the PD across the resistor is the same as the PD across the capacitor. So it means the PD across the resistor that is being registered by this graph is going to be the same as the PD across the capacitor, which we don't have here, whose graph, graph we don't have here. Sorry. The variations with the T of the charge Q and the capacitor and the PD across the resistor. So the graph for PD across the capacitor with the time will be the same as the graph for the PD across the resistor with the time because PD across the resistor is the same as PD across the capacitor since they're in parallel. And remember, charge is equal to CV, so charge is directly proportional to the PD across the capacitor. Therefore, it will also be directly proportional to the PD across the resistor. So it means if the charge is decreasing, the PD is also decreasing. Okay. Use the figure to show that the time constant, of course, time constant is normally given as ta of this of the circuit in the figure 6.1 is 5.4 seconds. Okay, so we know that um, I think the simplest method I will use is Q equals to Q naught e power or exponent negative ta over the time constant, which is capital ta. And remember, Q naught can be read from the graph. Q naught, I think this is Q naught, which is 0 0.9 millicoulombs. So Q naught is going to be equal to 0 0.9 millicoulombs. So I'm just going to consider a time where T is equal to the time constant. So if T equals to 1 time constant, Suppose small t is equal to one time constant. In other words, small t is equal to ta. It means q is going to be equal to q naught, which is 0 0.9 uh, millicoulombs. I will not change that. Then exponent negative, because these two are the same, this is going to be negative one. So what is q in this case? So in this case, uh, q is going to be I'll just say e power negative 1, then times 0 0.9. So this is going to be 0 0.33 millicoulombs. Then I can find from the graph, I can find t for which q is equal to uh, 0 0.33. Remember I said t is equal to ta. That's what I want to find. So from the graph, from the graph, for Q equals to 0 0.33 millicoulombs, T, which is equal to ta, which is equal to the time constant, is going to be equal to, so I have to look for 0 0.33, the scale here is 0 0.5 divided by 10, which is 0 0.05. So this is 0 0.1. 0 0.2, 0 0.3. This will be 0 0.4, so 0 0.33. I'll check 0 0.33 uh, divide by the scale, which is 0 0.05. Those are 6.6 .6 squares. 3, 4, I mean 2, 4, 6. Approximately 6. I'll take around six and a half around here. So I'll have to read this value here. The scale on the vertical axis is five over 10, which is 0 0.5. So this, uh, this value here is 5.5. So from the graph, for Q equals to 0 0.33 millicoulombs, T, which is equal to the time constant is 5.5 coulombs. 
Yeah, but this is a coward method. Another method, I'll use another alternative, which is a kind of mathematical. For those of you who like maths, you could use this method. It may not give exactly the same, the same answer. So we know that Q equals to Q naught e power negative small t over capital over over time constant. Suppose we consider small t being equal to a half half life or t a half. It means q will be equal to a half of q naught. So I will substitute those, that condition. So I have a half of q naught equals to q naught e power negative t, which is half life, which is t a half divided by ta. If I introduce ln, so I have ln over half equals to I remain with the power negative. Remember, this is a power. E power that. So I have negative t a half divided by ta. So it means uh, the time constant is going to be equal to, of course, the negative will remove uh, the, uh, the, it will be, this is negative ln of 2 divided by t negative t a half. So which is going to be ln of 2 over t a half. So I'll look from the graph and find t a half. Remember, uh, q naught was 0 0.4. Q0 was 0 0.9, so I divide this by 2 to be 0 0.45. So this is 0 0.1234. 4, 5 is here. And this is uh, in this, this box here. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.45 is in the box here. So on this x-axis we have this is 1, 2, 3, 3.5, and this is 3.75. So that is 3.75 approximately. So t half is 3.75 seconds. So I would just say um, no, this is this is wrong math here. Let me not skip a step here for simplicity. So this is negative ln of 2 is equal to negative t a half divided by ta. So it means ta is going to be equal to t a half divided by ln of 2, which is going to be 3.75 divided by ln of 2. It may not be exactly 5.5, but I think it is a correct method. 3.75 divided by ln of 2. So this is 5.4. 5.4 seconds. Let me check 3.75 divided by 0 0.693. Okay. But I'm very sure this will be credited because the method is correct. The only difference in this last significant figure is because we estimated in the middle of the box here. Otherwise, if this would give us an exact value. Of course, there's another method of taking two readings for Q from the graph and two readings for T from the graph and then uh, substituting to find, to find the value. For example, a student will take a uh, value of Q1 to be equal to Q0 e power negative t1 over ta. Then you take another value q2 being equal to q0 e power negative t2 over ta. Then you can divide the two equations. You can say q0, I mean q2 over q1, which is q0 cancels out. So remain with e power negative t2 over ta divided by e power negative t1 over ta. So in other words, you have that Q2 will be equal to Q1 e power. So when you, you subtract the powers, because you are subtracting, then it will end up being T1 minus T2 into brackets, then divide by ta. So when I subtract a value of Q2 with its corresponding value of T2, a value of Q1 with its corresponding value of T1, then divide by 
Then you introduce natural log, you'll be able to get a value of tau which is very close 5.5 seconds. I'll not repeat, I'll not do that. You could also use the gradient, but that will be more complex for non mathematicians. Then I use the figure 6.3, 6.2, figure 6.3 and the information in B to determine capacitors C in microfarad. So here I will not, I'll just use 5.5. I can't use 5.4 because the information in B is 5.5. So we want to find the capacitance C. So we know that capacitance C is equal to Q over V. So Q is, I'll just use Q naught. So Q is, I think Q was 0 0.9 millicoulombs, so times 10 to the power of minus 3, divided by V, when it is fully charged. So this is uh, 5, 6, 7, I think this is 7.5. So V is 7.5 at t equals to 0. Because I used the Q at t equals to 0. So this is going to be 7.5 volts. So I'll just press my calculator. 0 0.9 exponent minus 3 divided by 7.5. So this is 1.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4. And this is in columns. We want the answer in micro, so it will be 1.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4 divided by 10 to the power of minus 6. So divide by 1 exponent minus 6 to change it to micro, so that is 120. Then resistance R in kilo ohms. So of course we know that uh, the time constant ta is equal to R times C. So it means R is going to be tau, which was 5.5 divided by C, which is 1.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4. So 5.5 divided by 1.2 exponent minus 4. So this is 45833. Three. Four five eight three three ohms. So this is approximately forty six thousand ohms or forty six kilo ohms. So the answer here is going to be forty six. Oh, that is the end of capacitance. Define magnetic flux density. Of course, this is B. Remember from force equals to B. So it means B is equal to force per unit length, force per unit current. So you can say this is the force per unit, the force per unit length and per unit and per unit. Per unit current acting on a wire carrying current perpendicular. a uniform magnetic field to a uh, uniform magnetic field or to perpendicular to uh, magnetic field lines I'll just say perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field or perpendicular to the magnetic field lines perpendicular to the magnetic Field lines, this is force per unit length, force per unit current. Acting on a, a wire or a long straight wire carrying a current perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. 
that is a magnetic flux tends to be an insulated rectangular coil of wire consisting of 40 tons. So this is N. It's suspended in a, a cradle from a newton meter as shown in the figure. Okay. The vertical sides of the coil have a length of 5 centimeters and the horizontal sides have a length of 3 centimeters. The initial reading on the newton meter is 0 0.563 newtons. So that is the initial weight. A U-shaped magnetic magnet rests on a top pan balance that is set to a reading of 0 0.00 grams. The lower edge of the coil is lowered into the region between the poles of the U-shaped magnet as shown in the figure 7.2. So this is figure 7.2 now. We have a magnetic field. Remember initially without a magnetic field the weight was the weight initially was 0 0.563 newtons. The magnetic field in the region between the poles is uniform. Okay, so B is uniform, is constant. The lower edge of the query is entirely within the magnet the, within the uniform magnetic field. A current 3.94 amperes is now passed through the coil. That means now we have a current in the magnetic field, so it experiences a force. This causes the reading on the top pan balance to change to 2.16 grams. Explain why the current causes a vertical force to act on the coil. So the current is going to cause a vertical force because one, the current is uh, in the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And so by Fleming's left-hand rule, it means the, uh, there will be fo the force on the wire is going to be perpendicular to the current and should also be perpendicular to the field. Therefore, the force must be vertical because first of all, this is the lower end and we have a magnetic field. So it's like the current is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And at the same time, the current should be, uh, because this is a U-shaped, this was a U-shaped magnet. So if the current is perpendicular to the magnetic field, it also means the force should be perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the current. Therefore, there will be a force, which is vertical. So I'll say current in the coil is perpendicular. is perpendicular I think this was this this was the side view viewed from the side so if it was to be drawn in three dimensions I would draw something like this then I have a magnet no I have a magnet here so this is this is what we are seeing. This side is the one we are seeing. That means the field is like this. The current is perpendicular in that direction into the page. That means the force must be vertical, either upwards or downwards, depending on uh, the direction of the current. So the current in the coil is perpendicular to the, uh, the magnetic field. So the force I would say so by Fleming's left hand rule by Fleming's left hand rule The force on, I know I have the worst on writing, but it's okay. The force on the wire is perpendicular. The force on the wire is perpendicular to the current. And the field. Therefore, so the force is 
vertical. Some people may be wondering why the force is vertical. The magnetic field, let's say it is from north to south. But this part we are seeing is the side view. That means the current could be either into the page or out of the page. Because we are seeing the side view of the quail. So the current is either put your pen onto the paper, the point where the field is, it means it is either into the page or out of the page. So if you use Fleming's left hand rule, either the magnetic force is downwards or it is upwards, depending on the direction of the current in the quail. Okay, then determine to three significant figures the flux density B. So for equilibrium, of course, we know that the force is going to be called the weight, which is going to be called M times G. So the magnetic force, the magnetic force is going to in the coil is going to be given by a number of tons times bill. That's total magnetic force. For one ton, it will be bill, but there's 40 tons. So it is number of tons times bill that is total force. And this should be balancing with the weight, which is going to be mg. So if I make B the subject, B is going to be the mass, which was I think it was the change in mass was 2.1 times 10 to the power of minus 3 times g, which is 9.81, divide by um, the number of tons, which is 40 times the current. I make, I'm making b the subject. Remember, the current was 3.94 times the length which is in the in the in the section from the side the length is this part here which is 3 not uh not 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 5 it is a 3 so the length which is in the magnetic field when you view from the sides the length which is in the magnetic field is 3 so this is going to be times 3 times 10 to the power of negative 2 because it was in centimeters so i'll check with my calculator 2.16 exponent minus 3 times 9.81 divide by 40 times sorry I will continue dividing continue dividing by 3.94 times 3 exponent minus 2 so this is 4.48 times 10 to the power of minus 3 Teslas. Then tell me what is now the reading on the Newton meter, the new reading on the Newton meter. So the mag remember the magnetic force on the balance and the Newton meter are equal and opposite. The, mag the magnetic force on the balance and the Newton meter are supposed to be equal but opposite. But remember initially the weight was uh, 0.56. So they said explain your reasoning, the magnetic force. On the balance and the Newton meter reading of the magnetic force on the balance and The magnetic force on, on the balance and how should I put the magnetic force on the balance and the Newton meter reading the magnetic force on the balance and the Newton meter or oh, on the force on the Newton meter should be equal but opposite should be equal and opposite and if that is true it means um the newton initial the newton meter reading was 0 0.563 initially this should be equal to um the reading of the balance plus the weight the new weight when the, uh, which is equal to which is actually the magnetic force so it means 0 0.56 w this is the new reading 
of the Newton meter. Let me write this in details. So 0 0.56, 0 0.563 is going to be called the reading plus the magnetic force on the balance. So this is going to be the reading plus the magnetic force on the balance was equal to the weight that we well, that we mentioned upwards, which is mg. So it means the reading is going to be 0 0.563 minus mg, which is going to be uh, 2.16 times 10 to the power of minus 3 times 9.81. So this is going to be 2.16 exponent minus 3 times 9.81. Then I will say 0 0.563 minus the answer, which is giving me 0 0.54, 0 0.542. So the answer is going to be 0 0.542. So the magnetic force on the balance and the Newton meter and the magnetic force and the Newton meter should be or the Newton meter reading or the magnetic force on the Newton meter should be equal but opposite. Because of course the magnetic force will stretch the Newton meter. Okay. Then Lenz's law, of course, Lenz's law talks about direction. So we say the direction. direction of induced EMF is always such as to produce effects that oppose the change the direction of the induced EMF is always such as to cause or to produce effects that oppose the change that causes it or the change that caused it okay that is uh, this is law remember Faraday is about magnitude lens is about direction Two coils of insulated wire wound on an iron bar as shown in the figure here. So here we have a voltmeter and here we have alternating current. There is a current I1 in coil 1 that varies with the time as shown. Okay, so I can first tell the uh, maximum current here or the I0 here. This is 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, this is 0 0.85 amperes so the peak is 0 0.785 amperes the variation with the t of with the t of i1 can be represented by this equation here remember the general equation i is equal to i naught sine omega t where i naught is uh, amplitude so use the figure to determine the values of x and y of course x is equal to i naught which is the peak and we have seen from the graph to a 0 0.85. So this is 0 0.85. Let's check the units. That is amperes. Then y, we have seen that y is equal, we are comparing the two equations, y is equal to omega. I know that omega is 2 pi over the period, which is 2 pi divided by t. Let's check from the graph the period. The period is this time here, which is 0 0.04. So this is divided by 0 0.04. So we have 2 pi divided by 0 0.04. So this is 
I mean 157.1 so I'll just write 157 the units are going to be radians or you can write 5 pi yes I mean 50 pi the units are still radians it's actual radians per second The current in coil 1 gives rise to an, a magnetic field in the ion, but assume that the flux density of this magnetic field is proportional to I1. So B is proportional to I1. An alternating EMF is induced across coil 2. The PD across coil 2 is measured using the voltmeter and has a mean square, root to mean square value of 4.6. So this is V root to mean square. On the figure sketch uh, a line, to show the variation with the t of v2 between t equals to 0 and t equals to 0 0.08 seconds. So first of all, we know that v root mean square is equal to v0 divided by root of 2. They have given us the root mean, so we need to find the peak. v0 is going to be root of 2 times the root mean square value, which is going to be 4.6. I'll press my calculator to check what this is, root of 2 times 4.6 so this is 6.5 so the peak is going to be 6.5 this is 5 6 6.5 is around here so 6.5 is around here and remember v is directly proportional to current v is always in phase with uh, the current so the graphs are going to be perfectly identical but with the peak just at at 6.5. So I'll have a point here, there, zero. I'll have a point here, back to zero. Then I'll have it here, here, back to zero, then here, and so on and so forth. So I'll just draw a smooth curve. You can draw a better curve than mine. Okay, so the graph just looks like that. The graph just looks like that. I've just used this equation because the graphs are directly proportional. Since V is always directly proportional to I, it is only varying in uh, the peak values. So I just need the peak value to be 6.5. And then my graph stops there. They are directly proportional. So almost the same graph as that of current. Then use the laws of electromagnetic induction to explain this the shape of line in B Roman 2. B Roman 2 is the graph I've just sketched. So we are using the laws of electromagnetic induction. So we know that uh, magnitude of V2 is going to be directly proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux. Then use the EMF is directly proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic flux. So magnitude. That is according to Faraday's law. Magnitude of V2 is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux. And also, V2 is, of course, directly proportion to the gradient time graph. V2 is also proportional to the gradient of the I1 against time curve. V2 is going to also be proportional to the gradient of I1 over time curve. The induced EMF is directly proportional to the gradient of the current or because the, uh, the rate of change or the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage is the gradient. Remember, the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage is the gradient. So it means V2 is going to be proportional to the gradient of the I1 against T curve. And when you look at the graph here, you will notice that. Um,
I think I changed this graph. I changed this graph. Okay, let me first write the explanation. I will check the graph again. V2 is the is proportion to the gradient, induced EMF is proportion to the gradient. And when we look at this graph, when I is maximum, here the gradient is zero. So that means here V2 is going to be zero. So I think I changed the graph. I'll have to check it again. And when at t equals to zero, it means V here is going to be maximum. At t equals zero, V is equal to maximum. At t equals 0 0.02, V is going to be maximum. At equals to 0 0.03, where the gradient is maximum, the induced EMF is going to be zero. Okay, so I have to check that again. I will have to change this graph. Because by Faraday's law, the induced EMF is directly proportional to the rate of change of flux. Yet the rate of change is depending on the gradient. So it means I change this. So I have to change this. And the order doesn't matter whether I start from the bottom. So um, my graph is going to start from there. It goes to the origin. Then it comes here. Then it goes back to zero. Then it comes here. Then to come back to zero. One, two, three, four, five. Then it goes back to this point. One, two, three, four, five. Then it comes back to zero. And it will continue up to this point. Okay, I think the graph is like that. V2 is going to be zero at time t equals to 0 0.01. V2 is going to be zero at t equals 0 0.01, 0 0.03, 0 0.05, and 0 0.07 here. Because that's where the gradient from 0 0.075, that's where the gradient from this curve is. Here yeah, the gradient is zero. Whatever the gradient is zero, it means the rate of change is the rate of change is zero. Because the rate of change is the gradient, so that means the induced EMF is zero. Where the gradient is maximum, like at 0 0.2, it means the rate of change is maximum, so the induced EMF is maximum. Okay. So that is the graph must look like this. It is not the one which I drawn. So V2 is proportional to the gradient of the I1 against T graph. The magnitude of V2 is proportional to the rate of was well, the rate of change to the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage. V2 is proportional to the gradient of the I1. I1 against T curve. And we saw, we have seen that V2 has maximum magnitude when I1 against T curve is the steepest. That was at t equals to 0, 0 0.2. And v2 is 0 when the i1 against time curve is horizontal. Oh, is at um, okay. It is horizontal. That is either at the peaks. Then uh, there is a change of sign because the gradient keeps changing sign. So V two changes sign. When the sign of the gradient changes.
of the I1 against T curve changes. That's why we are having negative and positive values of V2. Because the sign of the gradient keeps changing. For instance, when you look at the first graph, I could say this first part is positive gradient, negative gradient, negative gradient, positive gradient, positive gradient, negative gradient, negative gradient. So the gradient keeps changing signs. So that means V2 should also change signs. Okay. Sorry for that previous graph. I hope I've corrected it. Then question number nine, the figure 9.1 shows the visible part of the emission spectrum from hydrogen gas in the laboratory. This is in the laboratory. The, number of, the numbers indicate the wavelength in nanometers. So this is nanometers. Because this is in the laboratory, this is going to be lambda in the laboratory. Explain how the emission spectrum provides evidence for the existence of discrete energy levels for the electron in a hydrogen atom. So we are seeing separate lines. And we know that each line represents a single frequency and a single photon energy. So I'll simply say each line corresponds to a single frequency. single frequency and a single photon energy. So each line represents a single frequency and a single photon energy. And remember the change in electron energy, or oh, uh, we know that um, the change in electron energy levels is going to is always going to emit a single photon energy change in electron energy level, change in electron energy levels, change in electron energy levels, or change in electron energy level emits a single A single photon. Every change or a change, I'll, I want to be specific, a change in electron energy level emits a single photon. So every change in electron energy level will, is, uh, will emit a single photon. And remember, the photon energy is equal to the difference in energy levels. Photon energy is equal to the difference. Photon energy is equal to the difference in uh, photon energy is equal to the difference in energy levels. Remember, a photon whose energy is equal to the difference in photon in energy levels is either absorbed or emitted. So this is discrete uh, energy changes imply discrete energy levels. This discrete energy changes imply discrete energy levels. So we've already mentioned why they are discrete energy levels because every line we see there is corresponding to a single frequency this corresponds to a single photon energy. And remember, a change in electron energy level always emits a single photon. And remember, the photon energy is equal to the difference between difference in uh, in in two energy levels. So these discrete energy changes imply that there are only only discrete energy levels exist. Or you could say discrete frequencies must have come from discrete energy gaps or discrete frequencies must have come from 
discrete energy gaps. Specific energy gaps. The figure shows five of the energy levels in the hydrogen atom, the wavelength of the radiation, the figure related to the transitions to minus 3.400 level in the figure 4.2. Show that uh, level X is negative 1.51. So I'll say the energy here is EX. Okay. So, um, of course, when we compare these energy transitions with uh, these uh, wavelengths, remember uh, the change in energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. So it means a bigger wavelength means a smaller change in energy. So it means the smallest change is from X to 3.4. This is the smallest change in energy. That means it corresponds to uh, the largest wavelength, which is uh, 658 nanometers. So I'll say transition from X from X to minus 3.4 electron volts corresponds corresponds to uh, 658 nanometers and remember change in energy is equal to hc over wavelength so the change in energy is going to be ex minus negative 3.4 electron volts should be equal to h which is 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 C, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8. The wavelength is 658 times 10 to the power of minus 9. But remember, we must have this energy in electron volts. So to change it to electron volts, I have to again divide by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. So that this answer is in electron volts. If I don't divide by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, it will be in joules. Yet on the left hand side, I have electron volts. So I'll check my calculator, 6.63 exponent minus 34 times 3 exponent 8 divide by 658 exponent minus 9 divide by 1.6 exponent minus 19. So this is 1.89. These were how many significant figures? These were 1, 2, 3. Three, four. So I'll say EX minus O plus 3.400 should be equal to 1.889, I think. So let me just, um, this is 1.889. So I will just subtract EX is going to be 1.889 minus 3.400. So 3.400, sorry, 1.889 minus 3.400. So this is giving us negative 1.511, or approximately negative 1.51 electron volts. Okay. Then the same part of the emission spectrum from hydrogen as in A observed in light from stars in a distant galaxy is shown in the figure 9.3. The numbers indicate the wavelength in nanometers. So you see that this line has changed from 658 in the laboratory to this one here from a distant star. The spectrum shows the same pattern as in the figure, but with a different wavelength. State the name of the phenomenon that gives rise to the change in wavelength. So because the wavelength has increased, this is called the ready shift. State what this phenomenon shows about the motion of the galaxy. Because the wavelength is increasing, it means the galaxy is moving away. It is moving away from the observer. Because the wavelength is increasing, the galaxy is moving out from the observer, the universe is expanding. 
Use one of the lines in the figure 9.1 and the corresponding line in figure 9.3 to determine the speed of a distant galaxy relative to the observer. I'll just use the one I used in the previous one, which was 686 six and 6. Um, the other one was 658. Okay, so from the redshift equation, which is given the list of formula, delta lambda over lambda is going to be V over C. So I want to find V. So the change in wavelength is 685. Is it 8586? 686 six, 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 minus 658 divided by in the laboratory it was 658. This is equal to V divided by 3 times 10 to the power of 8. That is the speed of light. So I don't change the units because I know the same units in the numerator and the denominator. They will cancel out. So I have 686 six minus 6. 8 divided by 658 times 3 exponent 8. So I'm getting 1.28 times 10 to the power of 3, 6, 7. So 1.28 times 10 to the power of 7. That is V. One point two eight times ten to the power of seven. Okay. Then the galaxy in V is known to be a distant, a distance of five point seven times ten to the power of twenty four from the Earth. Use your answer in B Roman three to determine a value for the Hubble constant H naught. So we know by Hubble's law V is equal to H naught times D. So the Hubble constant H naught is going to be V divided by D. 1.28 times 10 to the power of 7 divided by d, which is 5.7 times 10 to the power of 24. So 1.28 exponent 7 divided by 5.7 exponent 24. You should always have the idea of the power of Hubble's constant. It should be power minus minus 18. So this is approximately 2.2 times 10 to the power of minus 18. If you had rounded off this to maybe 1.3, you may get 2.3 times 10 to the power of minus 18, but the power of 10 is the same. So this, the, uh, the examiner will tolerate the coefficient, will tolerate 2.2. Then um, I think this is a blank page. We should be going to the last question. Medical physics, positron emission tomography involves the detection of gamma radiation in order to identify the position of origin of positrons in the body. Positrons are not naturally present in the body. Explain how positrons come to be present. Remember, positrons are beta plus, so we need uh, to introduce a beta plus emitter into the body. So a radioactive, radioactive tracer. Containing a beta plus emitter. Radioactive tracer containing a beta plus emitter is introduced into the body. Is introduced into the body. So before undergoing the scan, you are given, um, you might be injected by with fluorine 18 into the body. So that fluorine 18 is a beta emitter, so it is introduced into your body through what we call a radioactive tracer. A radioactive tracer containing a beta plus emitter is introduced into the body. Explain how positrons cause emission of gamma radiation from the body during PET scanning, of course. The positron interact with the electron. The positron is the beta plus. The positron interact with the electron. We know that the positron is the antiparticle of the electron. The positron is the antiparticle of 
the electron. So this pair annihilation, this pair annihilation, annihilation, this pair annihilation results in the mass of other particles. being converted results in the mass of the particles being converted into energy of gamma photons So this last part is the most important part. You must tell the examiner that the mass of the beta, the positron and the, the electron is converted into gamma, into energy of gamma photons during pair, during the pair annihilation. Show that the wavelength of the gamma radiation that is detected during pair scanning is approximately 2.4 picometers. Explain your reasoning. So I want you to notice that uh, it is an electron which comes together with a positron. This gives us a gamma two gamma photons. So I'll say the annihilation, because I said explain your reasoning. Annihilation. Annihilation of electron and positron produces two photons. So total energy is going to be twice of the mc squared is going to be twice of hf. Remember, energy is either mc squared for the particles and energy is hf for each photon. So there are two uh, elect particles come together which have the same mass, giving us two photons which have the same frequency. So I'll simply say delta m c squared is going to be equal to h c over the wavelength. So I want to find the wavelength, so lambda is going to be h c over m c squared, which is simply h c over m, so one c has cancelled, so it is h, it is h over m c. So when I substitute, this is going to be 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 divided by the mass of an electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31, then times C, which is the speed of light, 33 times 10 to the power of 8. I'll check my calculator, 6.63 exponent minus 34 divided by a 9.11 exponent minus 31 divided by 3 exponent 8. So this is equal to 2.43 times 10 to the power of minus 12 meters. They want to the answer in pico, so this is going to be 2.43 times 10 to the power of minus 12 divided by 10 to the power of minus 12. To change it to picometers, so this is going to be 2.43 picometers or approximately 2.4 picometers. So 2.4 picometers. I think that is the end of, this could be the end of this paper. Yeah, that is, that marks the end of paper 4-2 for October-November 2022. See you in paper 5. Bye-bye.